We have Walter Perez now with Lieutenant Colonel Bivens. Uh, we're now one on one. Walter, uh, we have lots of questions yeah. for him. One of which was, if he could <laughs> sit down with Cavalcante, what, what would he, he want to ask know? him? Yeah, well, we'll get to those in just a second. But first, I want to say, Lieutenant Colonel Bivens, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on the air with us. Uh, just first question is, what's going through your mind? I mean, my goodness, two weeks, finally found him. What was it like when you heard those words, we got him? Well, relief, obviously, is the first emotion, I think, that, uh, that I felt and I think anyone would. You know, one of the things that you worry about with an operation like this is, uh, are you going to get anybody in the community hurt? And are you going to get any of the members of your team hurt in the law enforcement group that's out there? And so to have this come to a successful conclusion and not have to deal with any of those issues, that's huge. So uh, I'm just I'm very happy and thankful that we've come to this conclusion and we're here today. What were the primary challenges? I mean, obviously the terrain was one of them. Certainly the terrain was one. Weather, we had uh, significant heat and humidity. And, uh, and, and just uh, large areas that had to be searched. You know, I talked uh, at one point about Longwood Gardens. That was an amazingly difficult area for our teams to search. And then even out, outside of that, there were, you know, a lot of challenges to the terrain. There always are when you get somebody out in, into an area. But I tell people, uh, you know, it's, it's not as though you're rummaging through your house looking for a lost set of keys. Uh, <laughs> when you have multiple square miles of area, and it takes a tremendous number of people to secure that, and you have to support that operation first, and then you have to find the people with the talent and the technology and the time to search that several square mile area looking for one individual who does not want to be found. It poses a lot of challenges, and uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm very fortunate to uh, have an agency with a lot of capabilities and to have partners uh, at the federal and local level that are willing to work with us and that, uh, that will bring their resources to bear as well when we need to, just as we will for them when they need us. And, and one of the questions we've been bouncing around in, in the newsroom is, is it more difficult in an urban setting or in a rural setting when you're doing this kind of operation? You know, I don't know that I would say uh, one is more difficult than the other. Each has its own unique challenges, and uh, there are limitations of what you can and can't do. Uh, and, and so you just have to be able to adjust. You have to know what the capabilities are uh, of your agency, of your partners, and be able to adapt those to the specific search. And, and juxtapose the resources that you did have as opposed to what you wish you might have had in terms of manpower for the original perimeter and for the second perimeter, like what's an ideal number of people to have and what were you working with? Well, you know, it really just depends on the size of the perimeter and, uh, and the ability to lock something down. Unfortunately, there's no way to know uh, what you may deal with on a particular day. And so you arrive at a scene, you, uh, you understand that you have somebody you're searching for, and so we started looking at maps and figuring out how we can secure that. Some areas have great road systems that lend themselves well to uh, positioning patrol cars as some of the first responders so that uh, you can quickly uh, put them in place. It takes longer if you're positioning people off of roads and having to direct them through wooded areas, fields, and so forth. It takes longer to secure the perimeter. And so the longer it takes, the bigger the perimeter has to be so that you can be sure that person is still in there. Uh, and there are just there are a multitude of things that go into how you initially uh, uh, develop that and what it takes in terms of the number of people. Uh, and then once that perimeter's up, then we start reassessing and how secure is it and, uh, you know, what do we have to do uh, to bolster it if, if necessary. What was it like when you got the calls saying this guy's got a gun now and now we know he's armed? Does that change anything in terms of the approach? You know, it really didn't change a lot for us in this case. We knew we had an individual we were looking for who had already committed at least two murders and uh, we considered him to be very dangerous and very capable of committing another murder. And so the question for us uh, wasn't whether he should be handled as that dangerous individual. It was uh, It's always good to know if he does have a firearm, but, uh, but we always treat Treated him as an individual who uh, may very well be able to obtain one and certainly would use it if uh, if given the opportunity. I know that Sarah and John are champing at the bit here to ask a question, so if you guys have one, tell me and I'll pass it along. You know, Walter, we're just very curious. I know that he probably has questions that he would love to get answered from Cabo Conte. What are the questions that, that he wants answered? Are there any questions that if you could speak with him directly, what would you ask of Cabo Conte? 
Uh, one of the things that I'm most uh, interested in right now is uh, about any assistance that he may have received, whether in the prison or outside of the prison while he was on the run. Uh, we have investigators that will attempt that interview uh, probably even as we speak, and, uh, and hopefully we'll have those answers. Uh, uh, but that's what I'm most interested in right now. Do you have a grasp on how many people he was in contact with in any way, shape, or form? Because from what I gather, he had no cell phone this whole time, correct? Uh, to the best of our knowledge, he did not have a cell phone this entire time. Uh, would that have made it so, easier if you had one? Or would you be able to ping the phone? Uh, it potentially would have made, uh, made it easier for us had he had it. Um, it also would have potentially allowed him access to other resources. So, um, you know, it's kind of a double-edged uh, sword, if you will. Uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, uh, uh, what, what other assistance and everything, again, we'll, we'll look now to see uh, what we can determine, um, what our investigators have put together over time, and whether there's enough that rises to the level of, uh, of additional charges that will all be determined here in the, probably in the near, near future. Lieutenant Colonel, on behalf of everyone here in Northern Chester County, thank you for your work. It was an incredible operation, and it uh, ended as a positive a note as could possibly have uh, unfurled. So congratulations and great job. Thank you. And I just, again, I thank the community for their support. And I'm happy that they can now go back to their normal uh, routines and lives. So I'm very happy for them and glad we could help. And I'm sure a lot of people agree. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel George Bivens, thank you so much. Thank you. Sir. We do appreciate your time. So once again, guys, there it is. Uh, the person who's been the face of this whole operation for the past two weeks, uh, he's been very forthcoming. And uh, he's answered every question that every media outlet has had. And now it's all wrapped up, and it's just uh, a real feather in the cap to have this whole thing wrapped up and Cavalcante behind bars. Yeah, we, and Walter, and please assure us that someone will get that man a cold beer <laughs> and a nap. I'll buy him one. <laughs> you, it, it's funny. You want to hear a true story? This yeah. is, it's funny you said that because when the news conference was over, he walked out, and all the other officials were still inside. And the first thing that happened when he came out, someone gave him a fish sandwich. <laughs> first thing that happened. And All other right. people started gathering around and gave him drinks and, and soda and things like that. So the community is so appreciative. And that was really the outpouring that he received when he walked outside from the media gaggle into the public. Well, hopefully he gets a good night's sleep yeah. tonight. Yeah, it'll be the first one in yeah. two weeks. Walter, thank you so much. <laughs> Great interview there. Yeah.